Welcome to another exciting adventure in unified robotics here at Lawrence Tech University in Southfield, Michigan. I'm Jim Kearns and today we're going to talk about the analog inputs that you find on the Atmel AVR chips, specifically the ATmega 128-4P that we use here in the lab. So we'll talk about a little bit about how they work and what they do, and then we'll get down to some example software. Uh, the software will be available to anybody watching this. So I'll put a link in the description if you find that interesting at all, just to get you started. Um, I'll tell you up front, it's not the best software in the world, not particularly elegant or anything, but it's it works and it's give you a jumping off point. Some highlights of the uh, analog input chip itself, there's eight single-ended channels. What single-ended means is you get the voltage with respect to ground. Um, they have a 10-bit resolution, so you're going to get a 10-bit number, but the absolute accuracy is plus or minus two least significant bits. So, you know, those last couple bits are kind of shaky, but that's that's typical. Nothing to get excited about. Um, the voltage input range is zero to VCC. Um, in the way we wire the chips here in the lab for our lab controllers, we're using the five volt um, voltage supply for that. You can use some of the inputs in a differential mode, which means that instead of referencing to ground, you essentially have a positive and negative input and you look at the difference between those two voltages. Uh, we're not using that now, I'm not gonna talk about it, but it is there if you need it. Um, there are different reference voltages you can choose. There's a couple of internal voltage, or you can use an external voltage like we do. Uh, you can leave it free running or just trigger it at a specific time. There's interrupts to trigger an in a conversion or interrupts when a, you can set when the conversion's done. So there's a lot of different things going on there. There's, there's quite a bit of uh, capability in these chips. Um, now, a couple notes on analog to digital inputs in general. Um, this one uses a successive approximation system, and I will point out uh, I have another video if you really want to go through all the details of analog to digital conversion and vice versa. Um, I'll, I'll put a link over here to one of my mechatronics videos that covers the um, analog to digital hardware in a more generic sense. But this uses an um, of approximation A to D, and what, the way that works is if you have a voltage in, and you have a um, essentially a digital to analog converter built inside that uh, A to D system, this whole thing is the A to D, and it has this digital to analog converter, which will create a voltage based on a digital number, and then it goes into a comparator. And basically, this is a successive approximation. It's just basically a multiple guess. Um, you output a voltage using the D to A converter, and you see if it's too high or low. And if it's high, you guess a, a lower number from the D to A. Let me write that so you can read it. You guess a lower number, and you just essentially do a binary search until you have found the, the, the digital output that brackets this analog voltage input. So that takes time, right? Uh, and there's several approximations it goes through. And here it says it's taking 13 to 260 microseconds to do all that. So we have to, you know, this whole thing is controlled by a clock, and we'll get into that in just a minute, okay? There's a sample and hold circuit in here. Basically, if you have your outside voltage, there's a switch, and you go to a capacitor, and then that goes into your A to D like that. So when you want to take a sample, you close the switch, charge up the capacitor, and then when you're ready to once the capacitor is charged, you open that switch and you can take the reading of that voltage. That has some implications. That's in general a good thing, but it has an implication because of the multiplexing you actually have. If we look over here on the left, um, I've drawn four different inputs here. One of them is connected to voltage, the others are just sitting here. Um, 
basically what the multiplex means is you can have up to eight different pins connected together connected in and you'll switch close the switch to select one of these at a time okay so let's say we close the switch and we select that first one the sample and hold is going to close this switch and charge up this capacitor right here okay and then as you you know that takes just a moment and then you open that switch and you can open that switch too and the a to d converter the analog to digital converter your or your analog input will now read the voltage across that capacitor okay now we want to read the second voltage so we'll close this switch here and let's assume that this is just open and there's nothing hooked to it we close the switch on the uh, sample and hold and basically that capacitor is connected to nothing on the input and it's connected to the analog to digital input on the on on this side but that has a very high impedance so so the capacitor is not going to discharge or change voltages it's just going to sit there and hold that voltage approximately so when we open this switch and open that switch the capacitor still has the same charge on it that it had from that first input and you know you're going to read the a to d and you're going to get the same number that you got before even though there's nothing connected and it can continue down for the other switches as you go so the tendency is if you have floating inputs um, they tend to read the voltage or the last value that you had connected to an actual input so sometimes you may think that an input's working because the voltage is changing but it could be just picking up and reacting to uh, you know something that you read on another channel so it's just something to be careful about okay when you have floating inputs here here we have a picture from the data sheet um, this has a number of things i want to highlight let's take a look at this picture over here we have um, our sources for the analog references uh, AVCC which is we what we use there's an AREF uh, input and there's some internal references which can be 1.1 or 2.5 volts uh, and those are selected using a couple bits in this AD MUX register here those bits there will select which of those inputs you're going to use other bits in that multiplexer go to the MUX decoder and those that essentially picks the uh, actual channel that you're going to use 0 through 8. Depending on what you have set up you could also do some um, differential inputs but we're not using those. So given this reference that's the reference voltage for this this here is a digital to analog converter so when that is set to the maximum value essentially it's going to output that reference voltage and given an input here which gets selected through the multiplex and goes through this sample switch here and it goes up to this comparator okay so now we compare the output of this 10-bit digital to analog converter with the voltage coming in from the analog source and depending upon if it's higher higher and you get essentially a high or a low out of that it goes back to the conversion logic which then changes the output of that digital to analog converter and it approx it's uh, switches back and forth and does that successive comparisons until you get a final result that gets loaded into these two registers ADCH and ADCL it's basically you have 16 bits there but um, 10 of those bits actually contain information in the top uh, top six are just empty okay um, there's a number of other things we have to be careful about here or be aware of as I said all this takes time it takes time for this digital analog converter to settle to a voltage it takes time for this comparator to settle so we have to have a clock that keeps things on pace uh, what's not shown in here is the cpu clock but the cpu clock is the master clock for the whole chip uh, when you get the chip from straight from the factory it's set to be one megahertz uh, you can use the internal oscillator 
to go as fast as 8 megahertz, and you can use external oscillators to go, I believe, 16, 16 or 32 megahertz. I think it's 16 on the on this particular chip. Um, and you could even go slower than the 1 megahertz. So the, the master clock can change speed pretty drastically, but the amount of time it takes for this hardware to settle is relatively constant. So what you want to do is have a... Um, clock inside this A to D converter that runs at about the same speed independent of the master clock. And the way they do that is they use this prescaler register here to take the master clock, which is running at 1 megahertz or um, 8 megahertz or 10 megahertz or whatever, and divide it and, and slow down the clock going into this convergent conversion register. Okay. Some interrupt inputs. There's... Uh, other inputs here to check, select the type of trigger. These bits here, I think I mentioned in that AD MUX uh, register, select which of the channels are going. And that's mostly what I want to talk about from this picture. So there's, there's other things going on, but we'll get into that as we get into the software. So speaking of software, here is the header file, and I'll put a link in the description so you can get a copy of this if you want. Uh, the way we've set this particular bit of software up is basically it reads all eight inputs as fast as it can go. So as soon as one value is read, it just triggers the next A to D input and it just goes around and around and around and around, you know, through all eight of those inputs. We put some notes on how to use it. Basically, there's a A to D, a to D underscore init function that will set up all the parameters uh, that we need to get the A to D working properly. The next line there um, is SEI. Basically, it enables global interrupts. I forget exactly what the acronym sets. And the other thing you, when you're ready to collect data is you just give it this command, get ADVAL and a channel number from 0 to 7 and it returns the latest A to D values for that particular channel, okay? So that's some notes I put in the header file. Uh, I've updated it since I, since I was uh, doing this, and I also put a note in about that prescaler. But. And in the actual code, we check for, to see if A, D underscore H is defined. If it's defined, we just skip all this code because that means we've run this already. These are commands to the compiler to tell it whether to compile this or not. Um, if it's not set, the first thing we do is set it so we don't do a double definition. We create this external variable, which is an unsigned 8-bit integer, and we call it AD complete. Um, that just gets set once when we've gone through that loop once to avoid reading channels that haven't been initialized at all. We have this function a to D init. This is an old function that process A to D. It's commented out here and commented it out in the code. You could go back to that if you wanted. That basically just did A to D's on demand. We have the function here, get A D val, where you send it the channel number and it returns a unsigned in 16 bit unsigned integer, okay, with the latest A to D values. And that's all that's in the header file that just sets it up. And let's go down to our actual sample code. This is the C file. We're including io.h, well, because A, we're doing a lot of input output here. And io.h has a lot of things defined for us, like uh, just for example, ADC, SRA, uh, ADPS1, ADPS2, all those things are defined. Um, so that we can refer to things by name instead of trying to find absolute addresses, and it makes life much simpler. AVR interrupt, because this whole thing is interrupt driven, and we need to define our interrupt vector down below. And of course, a to d, a to d live dot h is the header file we saw just above. Okay. So we declare an array of 16 bits of a to d values. Here's that a to d complete that we'll be setting. These two are not actually used, and we could actually remove that from our software. As I said before, the software is not elegant. It's not exceptionally well-written. 
It's just there to get you started and set things up. So let's talk about this A to D init function. Let me talk about AD mux first. We're, set, we're taking a value of 1, shifting it left, REFS 0 bits, and setting that bit in AD mux. And our note here is it selects AVCC for analog reference voltage. So if we roll down here, AD mux, and we're looking for REFS0, that's this one here, and there's also an REFS1. So basically, we're going to set these two bits to a 0, 1. Okay, and these bits select the voltage reference for the analog to digital converter shown in the table. And I've put here's that table right here. Since we're zero one, we're going to use AVCC as our voltage reference, and the A ref will put a capacitor on it to ground just so it sits there and doesn't do anything. Okay, uh, other options we could use a ref we could use internal pins as well so there's different different ways to do it this is just the way i did it and these other bits here will tell us which bit is active at any given time so we we'll, when we get into the software we're going to be changing these bits quite a bit but we want to change these bits without touching those so we have a d c s r a um, we're doing quite a few things to that some of it got separated on different lines but here we're uh, setting the bits ADPS1 and ADPS2. This is these go into the prescaler. Uh, we need to get the analog to digital frequency, the, that internal clock we talked about, somewhere between 50 and 200 kilohertz. Okay, and this is giving us a prescale of value of 64. So if we're running at 8 megahertz divided by 64. We end up with 128 kilohertz, and that's right in the middle of our range, so that's good. So those two bits down here are the prescale select bits, and here's the table. Uh, depending upon the value, you can divide by 2, 4, or 8, okay? And we're dividing by 8. So we're setting this bit ADIE to enable interrupts at the end of the A to D conversion. Here it is. When this bit is written to 1 and the I bit S reg is set, the ADC conversion complete interrupt is activated. So we're going to trigger an interrupt every time then A to D conversion is complete. We're setting the AD enable bit, so that just enables the A to D to begin with, turns that whole section of the chip on. ADSC, it will kick off that first analog to digital conversion as soon as we enable, as soon as we go. So we're just going to kick it off and letter rip. So as we go through here, we'll look at this MUX stuff a little bit. Again, the lowest four bits, MUX 4 through MUX 0, are these bits. And if those bits are set to 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, we're going to do channel 0. Channel 0, 0, 0, 0, 1 is channel 1. Uh, 2 is channel 2. 3 is channel 3. And you're seeing a pattern here. And 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 1 sets it's up to the channel 7. Okay. Here we get into the actual software. When I call get A to D values and give it a channel number, it just returns the value A to D vals for that particular channel. Doesn't get much simpler than that. So you call that, that uh, get A to D values, it returns the value, and that's all you really need to worry about in your application software because all the rest is just going to happen automatically. If you remember what we talked about at the beginning, it is set up, it just reads all eight channels, starts over, reads all eight, starts over, reads all eight, and it just keeps reading and reading and reading whether you want it or not. And at any time, you can just grab a value with this function here. How does it keep reading and reading and reading no matter what? Well, here is the actual software that controls the A to D conversions. Now, if you look at the beginning here, it says ISR <coughs> ADC underscore VECT. Um, ISR stands for Interrupt Service Routine. So this is a routine that's going to service an interrupt when it happens. And the interrupt vector is ADC VECT. So anytime this ADC VECT interrupt gets set, this is the routine that services it. And in general, you don't want to set up these interrupt vectors and enable them without having an interrupt service routine written because 
you set the interrupt and it goes off to do the routine and then what does it do? Do we know? Hmm. Okay. So how this works reads this parameter ADC low bit from the register ADCL. So it's reading a low bit. I'm going to go all the way back up to the top. We had this ADC data register which has six, 16 bits. There's ADD, ADCH and ADCL. Okay, Those are two 8-bit registers inside this 16-bit register. So the first thing we're going to do when we want to see what is the latest A to D conversion result is we're going to read that register. We'll read the low bit first, ADC, ADCL, because when you read that, it there's some internal logic here that's not shown. It essentially locks this register so it doesn't get overwritten um, while you're reading. So you read the low bit and it locks it until you read the high bit. You don't want the high bit changing because it's reading another channel. So it puts a little bit of a hold on things there. You read the low bit from the ADC and it locks the register. And then what we do on the next line is a little more complicated. We have that 16-bit register that contains the result of the A to D conversion. That's divided into two 8-bit um, registers, ADCH and ADCL. Okay, we read ADCL in that first line. And now what we're going to do is we're going to take ADCH, we're going to shift it left 8 bits, so it lands in the upper 8 bits of the 16-bit register we've defined as ADCHI bit, okay, ADC with the bad name. So, so we'll shift it left and land it into the upper part of that, and ADCL, we're just doing a straight OR, so that lands in the lower 8 bits of that register, because we're doing an OR of that low bit and the shifted high bit. So we've essentially populated a 16-bit register here with the A to D results. This bit gets a little bit weird here. I've got my 16-bit number that I want to save, but I need to know what channel I'm on, right? Which A to D channel. And the A to D mux, we had these bits in A D mux that set the channel that we're reading at any particular time. And you know the values of that give us the input channel from according to that table. But at the same time, I've, I've got some bits set up right here. In fact, I think it's this bit right here is equal to 1. Okay, um, So I can't just read that entire register and see what number it is because it's got extra bits set in it. And um, I want to ignore those bits, and I only want to look at these specific bits right here. And if you recall from my uh, binary arithmetic video, you know, we can do what is called masking. So what I do is this right here, ADMUX and 0x07, so that's 7 in hex. If I did that in binary, that's 1 plus 1 is 3 plus 4 is 7, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0. So when I do an AND with ADMUX and 7 hex, I get the results here when I do the AND. That's supposed to be an AND sign. Let me try that again. There we go. The results of my AND, well, whatever this bit here is, doesn't matter, we get a zero. Whatever this bit is, doesn't matter because we got a zero. We got a zero, we got a zero, we got a zero. And these three bits here will get either zero or one, depending upon whether these are zeros or ones. Okay? And that essentially is our channel number from here. So the net result here is just the channel number with all the other bits being ignored. So I'm, if I'm on channel uh, 2, for example, um, like I've drawn here, I'll set this in. I'll take this value of ADC high bit, which is our 16-bit result, and put it into the second entry in the array, or array 2. It's the third entry because we start counting from 0. But, um, you know, slot 2 of A to D valves. So I'll a to D vals ends up being a seven or excuse me eight bit 
array of these 16-bit numbers. Okay, that's how I get the numbers stuck in for a specific channel. I meant. So the next bit just controls what channel I'm on. If ADMUX equals 0x47, I'm cheating here. I'm saying that I know I have this bit set, and if if those three bits are set, it's 47. That's not a very good way of doing it, really. I should do a masking again and only look at at um, you know at these first four values here, actually five values. I should really just look at those because you know if somebody were to take this software and use it somewhere else and maybe change what we do here, um, then that number 47 wouldn't work. You know if you didn't want to do this automatic thing. So that's Unelegant, unrobust, and an opportunity for you to think about it and improve it. Okay, so we're saying basically, if it's equal to 47, we've gone through all eight channels. So we set 80 mux back to 40, which sets these to zero and leaves that as a one. Okay, and we set this ADC complete. Um, if this is the first time through the loop, that'll be set. If we've been through the loop before, it's already set, and it's just a wasted operation but that's okay make more bit more operations to not do that I suspect but basically that just says we've been through the loop at least once go ahead and use all the values that you want but if we're not at 47 the else we just increment ad mux so if we were at 000, we'll go to 001 and then we'll go to 10 and so on and we'll just keep incrementing till we get back to this 47 so that controls the flow through all eight channels. If I was only using two channels and I wanted them faster and I didn't want to waste time reading a whole bunch of channels I don't need, for example, uh, a quick change I could put right here instead of making that 47, I could make that 42, okay? Or I could have a register that contains a list of, of channels that are connected. There's, there's a lot of things we could do here. You know, this is, this is just quick and dirty. Get it working. Let you, let you use the software. Okay. Now we set up AD MUX for the next A to D reading. And um, we take the ADSC. We, we take a one and shift it over ADSC into ADCSRA to trigger the next A to D. And let's go up and look at it. And that's this bit right here. And it just says start the conversion. So it's just making sure that we trigger the conversion um, at the next time. Okay. So that's it. That's the whole A to D software setup that uh, I've created for you guys to start with. Warts and all. Um, again, I'll, the link in the description will tell you where to grab it if, if you want to grab it just for something to start with. Um, most of the work is done in this interrupt vector. So in your mainline code, you don't do anything, right? Well, I shouldn't say you don't do anything. All you do in your mainline code, all you do in your mainline code is, is set the A to D init, you know, one time as you're doing the initialization at the beginning of the program, you enable interrupts. And then at any time you want an A to D value for a particular channel, you just call get A D val and magic happens. So that's it. Thank you for uh, paying attention, I hope. <laughs> and uh, see you next time. Bye.